Good evening, everyone. Si. Welcome. If I can, um, thank you for coming. We're very happy to have you join us for a great chart lab tonight. To kick us off tonight, to begin the program, we're going to have our fabulous CEO, Alison Cocoros, share a few words of welcome for us. Please help me welcome her. Thank you. Good evening, how are you? Good, good, are you excited? Yes. Good, well I am too, and this microphone is stuck. There we go. I'm so glad to see all of you here, and this is the second in a series of charlas that we are doing here at the school and that we're very excited about, and that will be culminating in September with an event hopefully at the Smithsonian Museum, where we come together to celebrate the rich and amazing and important stories of the 1970s and the history and the formation of this amazing Latino community. You know, we look back in the early 1970s and there were very few supports for the community. And in a short amount of time, You've heard of the Big Bang in the universe, right? Where the universe happened. These organizations occurred. The PELA, Program of English Instruction for Latin Americans that became the Carlos Rosario School. The Mayor's Office in Latino Affairs came to life and came into being. The Latino, uh, the Latin American Youth Center came to life and came into being. And so this series of charlas that we're doing is an opportunity to hear these stories and to learn from these stories of leadership and of fighting for the rights of the Latino community. And these are stories that all of us can learn from today and be inspired by. The Latino community can learn from, all of our immigrant students can learn from because in a time like this, we need to learn from those who went before us. Am I right, students? Yes. We need to take time like we're doing tonight to hear the stories from people who were there in person and hear how they accomplished what they accomplished so that we ourselves can be inspired. I think back of my uh, experience at the school. I started as a teacher in 1994, and then our school went through crisis. And today we'll be talking about student engagement. And let me tell you, I remember as a teacher, my students going with me and following our principal, Sonia Gutierrez, with signs saying, save our school in 1995 and 1996. And then when it was time to reestablish the school after it was closed, and we had a public hearing for the school, petitioning for the school to become the first adult education charter school in the entire nation, guess what? The room was full, I mean full, of immigrant students from throughout Washington, D.C. in 1997 saying, the Carlos Rosario School needs to be reestablished. And then look at where we are today. Now we are this charter school, and the school was reestablished. So I'm so grateful to our speakers who are here with us today to talk about the 1970s. Sonia Gutierrez, the president emeritus of the, uh, the founder and president emeritus of the Carlos Rosario School, and Jose Suero who was very involved in the 1970s, and Pedro Aviles as well. So very grateful to each of you for being part of this series of charlas and sharing your personal stories today. And also very grateful to this amazing woman here, Naomi Ayala, who is a wonderful leader and coordinator and writer, and to the team of staff, because this kind of thing really does take a team working together including Ana Reyes, who I don't know if she's here in the audience. Thank you, thank you to each of you who's been part of thinking about these charlas and making sure that this is a rich 
opportunity to learn about how to raise our voices and how to be heard, and especially, specifically, student voices. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allison. So, as Allison mentioned, um, we're going to hear from three of our community leaders today. And they're the people in many, many ways to whom we owe many of the privileges and opportunities, especially for education, that we enjoy in our Latino community today. So it's a very, very special evening for everyone at Carlos Rosario to have them here. This is a unique opportunity to bring the three of them together. You're going to hear them. First, Alison mentioned that this charla today, um, as she said, is the second in a series of community charlas. And they're part of the Nuestra Ciudad project, which is very, we're very grateful to have sponsored by the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs. Um, you'll hear the speakers really talk about the past, and you're going to see how it very much connects to our present and how each of you uh, can have a role in what happens in our community today in 2018 and why these lessons they learned and are sharing with us are so important for us. They focus around four areas that have everything to do with our Nuestra Ciudad project. And these areas are collaboration, strategy, innovation, and representation. And in many ways, this is what it really means to be an artist, having at least some of these elements. So we're going to learn about them, uh, about these from their perspective today. So I'm going to give you a few words of introduction to them. Then later in the program, uh, we're going to have, a, um, as I mentioned, a question and answer period. We're also going to have a current day a uh, Latino student activist speak to us about her experience and respond to our speakers. Um, the first, Sonia Gutierrez, as all of you probably know, is the founder and president emeritus of this fabulous school. She has received many awards for her work, including the American Dream Medallion in Education from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Sonia also serves as the president and chief executive of the Community Capital Corporation. Jose Suero spent 25 years publishing and editing the Spanish language newspapers El Latino and La Nación. He's one of the founders of Gala Theater and once served as the director of the Latin American Youth Center. Today he serves as the chief executive officer of Santi Marin and Associates and as the managing editor of the Metro DC Hispanic Contractors Association. Pedro Aviles is a graduate of Wilson High School, as well as PELA, the program of English instruction for Latin Americans that later became the Carlos Rosario School. Mr. Aviles holds two degrees from American University, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, and a Master's in Organizational Development. In the 1970s, Mr. Aviles became a youth leader and organizer with the help of more experienced organizers who taught him about issues like affordable housing and immigrant and educational rights. Then, in the 1990s, Mr. Aviles served as a spokesperson of the Latino community during the Mount Pleasant riots. Please help me give them a warm round of applause. Thank you, Ron, Sonia. I'm on? You are on. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Gives, it gives me great, great pleasure to be here in this auditorium. Uh, when we reestablished the school and in 1987, they closed us in 1996. We reopened in 1997. And this was the first building that uh, we rebuilt. And so I have great memories of this auditorium. And um, we're here to speak tonight about the 70s and uh, particularly as it um, reflects on the youth. Uh, in the 70s, early, I came, uh, I started working at this school, uh, 
it was Pele in 1972, Carlos Rosario brought me. And Carlos Rosario at that time was considered the leader of the Latino community. Um, and he had a group of us, there were about five of us, that they called us La Vieja Guardia, right? So, you know. Later on. Eh? Later on, they called us La Vieja Guardia. Because it was, we were the group that, we were lo, como los soldados de Carlos Rosario. He would tell us, you go here, we would go there. So anyhow, under Rosario, we established different kind of programs addressing uh, the needs of the, of the Latino community. But for youth, there was not a lot in the, in the, in the early 70s. Marcelo Fernandez Sayas, who was the first director of this program, of the program of PELA when it was established in 1970, he moved, um, he immediately saw that we were having serious problems with the children in schools, the children and the young people in school. Uh, in the 70s, there were thousands, early 70s. In fact, it started, the movement started in the 60s, right? That thousands of, of Latinos started coming uh, to this area and they were coming with, uh, with problems because they had, they did not speak the language, uh, they did not know the, the system, they did not um, know the politics of the city, they didn't know traditions, anything about the city. So um, with, the, with the adults, we were able to deal with them at Pela, and, and, and Catholic Center also had a program and set center, no set centers uh, concentrated more on children, but with the young people there was nothing. So Marcelo Fernandez had the vision of establishing bilingual education in the city because the Bilingual Education Act um, had been um, approved by Congre Congress, I think it was 1968-69. So and the city had not applied for funds for bilingual education. He took that initiative with Rosario and they went to Congress and negotiated for Congress to, to provide the funds for bilingual education to DC public schools. And so the funds came to DC public schools. Marcelo went to establish bilingual education in the city and then I came to Pela to run Pela. Um, the students, the kids in the, in the schools were really suffering because they didn't speak English uh, and they didn't have ESL teachers at that time, that's teachers of English as a second language. The, our kids were placed mainly in, in special education. Special education is a program within the school system where the kids that have, um, that are, they call handicap, go to kids that are autistic or, or have any other kinds of, 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 of problems go to. Of course, our kids, didn't, our kids did not belong in special education. The problem with the kids is was they didn't understand English and they didn't have counselors that would tell them about, about, about this country and, and, and how things work in this country, anything. So when Marcelo created uh, bilingual education, he brought with him two very important people, Father Jose Somoza, and I don't know if some of you um, knew Father Somoza. Father Somoza was el párroco de, de la Iglesia Latina in California Street for years. Uh, Marcelo brought him to be really the manager um, of, the, of, the, of the schools. And he brought also Sister Marianne Justis, who was a nun. She used to work in Change Incorporated, and she was a counselor, so she, she came to council. So Marcelo established the first bilingual school in the city, which was Oyster School. And to do that, uh, he got grants from the government and established what the Spanish Educational Development Center, said center, was established, people don't know this, but this center was established mainly to train the teachers that were going to bilingual education, they, and ESL teachers. So after those teachers were trained, they were placed in Oyster, and Oyster still remains today, it's a totally bilingual school, and also, he made sure that he had trained ESL teachers, English as a second language teachers, and trained bilingual counselors to be placed in every single solitary school. And let me tell you, I remember Marcelo, I mean, because he was also one of my mentors, uh, um, and, and I really owe him also a lot. 
And the Marcelo, when he used to monitor all these schools, and if he heard that one of our Latino students were being mistreated or whatever, my God, those principals beware because he would go to those schools and raise really hell. So they were, he really advocated for our kids um, and make sure that they were placed in the correct classes, that they had English as a second language teachers, and that they had counselors. Si Sister Mary Ann Hustis, her role was working, she, she was a school community coordinator. She would go to the houses of the kids that were having some problems and work at home with the kids and with the, with the parents. So that really, and, and bilingual education in the schools to this day works, and that is thank, thanks to this great man, Marcelo fernandez Ayas. He passed away a few years ago. In fact, I should tell you that in our group, we were about 15 of us that were considered leaders in the 1970s. We were the ones that set up most of the organizations and agencies that still exist today in the Latino community. Um, and it was really hard, really hard because um, it was the 70s, African Americans were coming out of the civil rights, okay? You know that African Americans had to struggle so much in this country to gain their rights. And they gained their rights, and here we come in the early 70s, Latinos saying we demand our rights too. So they look at us like these people are crazy. We just came out of civil rights and now they want a piece of the pie. So yes, we wanted a piece of the pie. And how did we win it? By strategizing, our main strategist was Jose Gutierrez, and because he came from New York. So then, you know, we realized that in order for us to keep our programs growing and going, we had to develop a political strategy. And the main strategy was how does the system work in DC? How to work with African Americans? Because at that time they used to call this city Chocolate City, okay? Uh, because it was mainly black and they were the ones in power. So we immediately began uh, to n know the politicians, know them personally, uh, learn about the political system in the city and how it worked, where the money was and everything so we could apply for grants. And one of our, the big things that we did was we established, uh, we wrote legislation, mainly under Jose Gutierrez, we wrote legislation to establish the Mayor's Office of Latino Affairs, that office, is, was established with the purpose of not only representing the, 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 the mayor, having a director that would represent the mayor in the city, but also that person would be the person through uh, monies would be channeled through. Like uh, say Centro Nia or, or, or Mary Center or whatever, Latin American Youth Center Gala, they need money in different areas. They used to have to go themselves and plead, I, re, I mean really plead to get some money. That was really resolved when we established OLA because OLA was, um, we established OLA within the office of the mayor and made the, the director of that, that office a cabinet member. That's getting power. Okay, and, and that office does that till this day. In fact, one of the directors of that office under Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly is with us and she's Carmen Ramirez. She was the director of that office for four years when Sharon Pratt Kelly was the mayor and helped the community a lot. Thank you, Carmen. So uh, besides doing the Mayor's Office of Latino Affairs and everything, we had most of our agencies were uh, funded by United Way, foundations and everything, and it was a struggle. Let me tell you, even I, as, as the director of PAYLA, I started with 100 students, and that grew. In two years, we already had like 300 students. And, and, and I had a grant, so I had to be fighting every year also to get my money. Until I put a big, big fight, uh, one year in 75, to get into the regular budget of, of the schools. But let me tell you, as a Latino, you don't get anywhere unless you struggle. And, and, and you don't get any rights until you demand your rights. And that's what we did. We demanded that, that, that the government pay attention to the rights of Latinos to an education, to a right to Latinos, to health care, and, and, and other, and other uh, needs, and we were very successful. We opened the way in the 70s for the ones coming in the 80s, 
okay? But it was spending 50% of your time running your program and 50% out demonstrating. Now, we needed to, to, to engage our, our students because I was the one at Pale, I was the one that had uh, more people because my students, <coughs> from 100 students in, in a year, I had already like 200. Whenever there were demonstrations, and there were demonstrations constantly, because if we knew that Catholic Center was not getting their money, or Set Center, or Andromeda, or whoever, we would demonstrate. Who were demonstrating? My students, you, in those years. Pedrito, who was our student in, I don't know if Pedro, you went to any of our demonstrations, but in the 70s, it was demonstrations, demonstrations, but what did I do at Pela? We communicated with the students. I had a great school community coordinator called Pedro Luján, and he and I would tell the students what would happen, what was happening, and make, make them part of the struggle. And they learn a lot, those students learn a lot, and they learn that if you don't fight for your rights, nobody's gonna hand it to you. So my students were in demonstrations all the time. My students and the students from uh, Set Center, students from Catholic Center, and, and, um, and I don't wanna take any more time because I, Suero and Pedrito particularly, um, are going to speak also about what other programs, like a very important program, which is the Latin American Youth Center, and how did uh, that happen, and how much it's been done since then for Latino youth. Uh, but important to establish credibility, very important. Why we had to work so hard, and let me tell you, when in the 70s, of course, I was young, we were all young, but the majority of the old guard is dead. There's only three of us alive, they're all dead. And yeah starting with Rosario. But we established credibility. How did you establish that? We had programs that were successful. Because let me tell you, I used to go to Pela 9 o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't get out till 10 o'clock in the morning. I never got home before 11. And that was the way I live in the 70s, because we had a very, very small budget, and it was like five of us running the program. The same with the other programs that were in existence, Andromeda, Latin American Youth Center, Spanish Educational Center, and there weren't that many in those years. But we had to work seven days a week, uh, day and night, to make sure that we would run effective program. Why? Because you have to establish credibility. You know, Carlos Rosario would not be a charter school with this building and the SG building if we didn't have credibility if we didn't prove that we're an effective school, an effective program. So you have to be very, work very, very hard to make sure that you have your credibility saying, because you cannot go to the government and say, give me $100,000 for this program and, and tell us how is the program doing, unless you have credibility that you're doing very well and that you're really helping people, because that's what we're about, helping people, helping immigrants, okay? So you establish your credibility not only as far as program is concerned, but as leaders with integrity, that nobody's gonna mess with you. You mess with me and you're in real trouble, let me tell you. And I was a really nice girl. People that know me from the 70s, particularly Marcelo Fernandez used to say, ay Dios mío, when Sonia got here, she was esta lady de Puerto Rico, que in a year, yo era una fiera. <laughs> and I have remained a fiera because I, I learned, and, and Rosario was my inspiration, really, he was, that you fight for what you believe in. What did we believe in? You, the immigrants, and we would do anything and everything for you. And let me tell you, to this day, I still do, and I know that Pedro and, and Suero feel the same way. So, so uh, with that, I think I've covered everything, Naomi, and, and that's it, and then I'll be ready for, for your questions later on. Me? Okay. Buenas noches, todo el mundo. No, 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 no. Buenas noches. Así me gusta. Todos estamos despiertos ahora, ¿ya? I'd like to put a little, uh, uh, what Sonia said in a little bit of context. Uh, this is a very unique community. It is the newest Hispanic community in a major city in the United States. In, in 1960, the Census Bureau said 
there were 10,000 Spanish speaking in Washington. None of them, by the way, was Salvadoran. How many Salvadorans in the house? All right, all right. So you've got to understand that Sonia Gutierrez is not only an iconic pioneer and a fiera, like she likes to say, but she's the, do <laughs> excuse me, she's the Dolores Huerta of our community. She is a founding leader. Uh, you know, <clears throat> so many other communities, long, let me get some water, excuse me. So many other communities, uh, Houston, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, these are older communities. In 1960, there were 10,000 Spanish speaking. Now, what happened? Well, obviously, the first thing you got to say is the influx of Central Americans, mostly, mostly Salvadorans, that came to this town beginning somewhere around 1970. Now, I'm going to read from uh, this magazine. This is a collector's item, and you can't find it on the internet, as uh, you know already, Reynold. <laughs> but I want to read just a couple of things so you get it. This was written by the gentleman who is now the executive editor of the Washington Post, Charles Lane. He went down to Intipuca. Everybody know Intipuca? Yes, yeah. yeah, there you go. So he says, eh, eh, in fact, it began in January of 1967 when a young bank clerk from Intipuca, Sigfredo Chavez, who used to live right in front of Rosario, Sonia, on the other <laughs> side of the street, broke up with his wife. The failed marriage left Chavez, then 28, alone in a family-oriented society. There's only one thing to do, a friend advised him. Go to the United States, get a job, and forget about it. Now, pay attention to this. In those days, the US consulate gladly, <laughs> gladly gave tourist visas to the few Salvadorans who asked for them. <coughs> and Chavez soon found himself wandering around an airport terminal in Orlando. I'm looking for work, Chavez explained. Well, she told him, you can go to Miami. There's a lot of Cubans there who speak Spanish. Or you can go to Washington. Nobody speaks Spanish. But there, there's a lot of work, and the pay is better. <laughs> uh, uh, on that basis, Chavez hopped on the next plane to National Airport. Now, that, that's 1967. Uh, in less than 10 years, there were 10,000 Intibuqueños in Washington, D.C. I came from Spain. I was a, a student. My family's Spanish. And uh, I got here, and I was studying at George Washington University, and I did theater. That's why you were saying before that I was a founder of Gala, because they had money in the school, and, and I channeled it to, to Hugo and Rebecca, and the three of us signed the incorporation papers. I, being El Revuelto y El Revolucionario, left right away, and they've now built the theater over 44 years. But I did, I became the director of the Latin American Youth Center. And, and, and Naomi and Sonia have been asking, the Youth Center started by two men that are still alive today. See what I mean about what you're seeing is the pioneers of, of, of a Latino community that is the newest Latino, I mean, I'm repeating this, I know, but Reynold, you know this, this is the newest Latino community in the country, the youngest. So I, I got to, I was doing theater, and this crazy guy named Erasmo Lara, by the way, the youth center had to be established. It had been established by Gary Garber and Arturo Griffiths. Obviously, nothing got done at that time if Carlos Rosario didn't say, I approve. Yeah. But uh, uh, Arturito Griffiths and Gary Garber were the first to create the Latin American Youth Center uh, through the offices of youth services, I think it was called, and a guy named Jimmy Jones, a wild, wild guy. Jimmy Jones. Who was a guy named Jimmy Jones. I was director for three summers, 1973, 1974, 1975. I was younger than the teenagers then, so that, that's why I, I look so good now. I'm, I'm the youngest here. <laughs> uh, when I got there, Erasmo said to me, can you do something with these kids? And I was doing theater. So uh, you may remember some of this, Pedro, but uh, I, I did at the festival, I did the youth day, yeah. and I would so I would do can. street theater with these recent immigrants, very few Salvadorans still. This is, I'm talking about 72, 73, 70, and, and we would do something like uh, we would get Dominican kids that had just gotten here three or four months, and we'd do a little storyline on stage where he'd say, I'm hungry, but I can't find arroz y habichuela, and they'd say, well, go to McDonald's. There was still a McDonald's on the corner. 
and then we would get him you know, a sandwich or something like that, and he would bite into the sandwich, and this young, new Dominican immigrant guy would go grab his neck and go, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. <laughs> we, we focused on two other things. We, we did little skits about if immigration uh, comes near you, here's what you have to do. And we also did, at that time, imagine that, we also did uh, violence, family, uh, you know, violence in the family. That was a big, it was a serious okay. issue. Yeah. So I, I was at the Latin EU Center as its director from 1973 to 75. As I told you, I, I was newly arrived, just finishing college at GW, and I'd come from Spain, and so all these guys would come, Sonia, and they would go, can we practice here tonight? And I'd go, sure, what are you practicing? We have a little band. So I'd say, sure, I'll stay late. You, you, you can practice in that room. And they would bring with Ken Ken, Kung Kung, and Budwa, Budwa, Budwa. And they, they would have all this instrumentation. I come from Spain. I didn't know what the hell. It, I didn't, it didn't, you know, they would speak Spanish. So I knew what they were singing and stuff. But it was like totally brand new. We wrote a, we wrote a, we wrote a proposal, Sonia, to the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, over a period of five years, we did over $150,000. We brought all of these old, grizzled musicians into a basement with all these young kids that all they wanted to do was bop on the, on the drums. And, and we had a wonderful time. A number of those kids, talking about results, a number of those kids became musicians afterwards from the instruction at the Latin American Youth Center in the Escuela de Rumba. Eh, eh. Pedro, who is probably at a certain juncture the person who has most embodied this community, has most represented certainly its youth, and, and after the, the uprising, the Mount Pleasant Nine. uprising, because it wasn't a riot and it wasn't this and that, but it was an uprising, it was Pedro who was the focus of attention both locally and nationally and internationally as one of the leaders of this community. So, I, I think I can probably leave it at that, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I've given you more or less the taste, and it's 7.13, so I, I'm, I'll end up here. What, what, uh, what I wanted to emphasize once again is, in Pedro, uh, certainly in Sonia and myself, you're watching people who created a community. And, and I don't mean created it, but they, they establish it. Sonia's struggle is not a struggle like a classic civil rights struggle, say in Delano with Chavez or with the Black Panthers. It's the struggle that they fought for in the 1970s was an educational struggle. They figured out that the best way to advance people's interest wasn't you know throwing stones or or confronting, confronting leadership, although they did a lot of that, yeah, but do. was creating systems and structures and organizations mm -hmm. that would rise up our people educationally. And that's why today, you, Allison, you, der you, you deserve enormous credit because this has now become a model, an international model, a worldwide model for adult education and, and bilingualism, et cetera. The Carlos Rosario is a really unique school and you should all be very proud of it. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, I'm not going to ask you to say good evening. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it is really, I, I'm grateful for the invitation. Um, I've, um, I'd like to kind of tell you, tell you a little bit about myself because when, I, when I'm I hear um, uh, Suedo and, and um, other people call me a leader. I, I, that's changed a lot, but, but I'll tell you a little bit about my story. In the context of these three questions, these three dimensions that I, that I want to talk about. Because I did come from El Salvador in 1974. So by that time, Suedo and Sonia were already leaders. Uh, my mom basically said, you know, you want to learn English quicker, go to Pela. I would go to school in the mornings at Wilson, and in the evenings I would come over. That's how I met you, and I met Jose, and I met some of the teachers. Yeah. I, I met you later on at the Latin American Youth Center. Right. But at that moment, like many immigrants in any part in the world, we're trying to, to, to build a sense of community because it's only a few of us. I, there was about 35 Latino students at Wilson back then. 
And I must say that thanks to the work that um, you and uh, Marcelo Fernandez have done, we did have a Spanish-speaking counselor, Mr. Keralt. Do you remember? Oh, remember the Spaniard. So that was, that was great. That, that, that's how I began to build my own community. But I was a teenager. I was not an activist yet. Um, it was not until we were, this is like in 1977, we lived on Midwood Place and Columbia Road because that was sort of like where everybody would come to Columbia Road back in the 1960s and 70s. And that's where the Latino businesses were, were back then. It's still La Churreria is still there. Librato. <laughs> anyway, my point is that it was through being a member of the Latino soccer team at Wilson, being, um, being a student at Pela, that I began to build my community. Then I, in the summer jobs, I worked at uh, Adelante. Oh, I worked yeah. at uh, uh, Ayuda and at the Barney House, which was more a uh, uh, camp for African-American kids because there, no, there were, they were not too many Latino kids back then. And that's when I began to build my own community. I met Puerto Ricans who were like Sonia and Jose, activists who knew how the system operated because they, by virtue of being US citizens, they knew how the system operated and they had strategies. I happened to be a kid that learned from them. But I also met a different set of communities that was more like the radical left, the people who were against Pinochet, the people who were fighting, you know, keeping track with the Sandinista revolution, the Granada invasion. All these political movements that were going on in Latin America were also impacting me because I was from El Salvador and myself, El Salvador went to this. So that also helped me build my own community. And what, what, what that did, at, and now that I realize, and this is maybe something that you might relate to, is that by having that community, you're building networks you are beginning to build relationships with the people. I mean, I got a job at the Latin American Youth Center because I knew Enrique Rivera, and he says, Pedro, you know, we need a youth representative at the board of directors. Do you want to come and join us? And I said, yes. Then I became a staff member, and so on and so on. And I did that for about 10 years. But having that sense of belonging, building the community is, in fact, what I think it's, it's something that, that helped me a lot to move forward and to give me a sense of who, who I was, which is the other part. It's like. How much do I care about my community? Do I care about my community that's being kicked out from Adams Morgan? What am I going to do about it? You know, that's when I joined Adelante, began to do some housing organizing work so that we try to either you know, buy the buildings or, 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 or one way or another get some money so that if we were kicked out, somehow we would get yeah. some benefit from it. We would not have the Kennesaw building at the corner of 16th and Irving Street had it not been by the tenant organizing that was done back then. And in fact, the owner, the people who live in, the, in, the, in those apartments own them and a lot of them are still, you know, in their 70s probably, if, if not more, who still live there because they inherited that building through struggles. In other words, they struggle. built power which is another dimension of building community. You want to you wanna come and say, we're here, we're here to stay, and I know that you're not going to give me anything unless I demand it. And that's what some of you did yes. at the very beginning. Yes. And that's what some of us did later on, yeah. right after the Mount Pleasant disturbances. Now, growing self-esteem, in my opinion, in my experience, means it's not only loving yourself, but loving the community that you belong to. And now, in my case, my community extended from the Salvadorian teenage community at Wilson to the Latino community, later on to the immigrant community. Because I'm an immigrant, and yes, I am from Latin America, but there are immigrants from all over the world. Yeah. We are all on the same boat. And at that time, although the laws were not as restrictive as they are today, we still had issues that dealt with immigration. We hadn't documented. We had people that were struggling. There was police brutality. I mean, all those things were going on. And we were, in so many ways, we needed to organize in order to basically fight for our rights. And that's a lot of what self-esteem is all about. I mean, how can you let somebody trample under you? You have to kind of stand up and fight for your right, like Bob Marley says. You know, stand up, stand up for your right. And lastly, personally, I'm going to speak for myself. I mean, I did all these things. I did street theater. I did you know, youth organizing. We did the festival. We did a lot of the cultural activities. I didn't know back then that that was activism. But I did join later on the Mayor's Commission on Latino Community Development. 
you know, that, I felt proud. I, I felt that I was realizing myself because I was being given roles of uh, leadership that probably I had earned because I had stuck you around with yes, uh, some of these mentors that I had. Later on, I went to do a lot of uh, community organizing with young people, creating leadership development experiences for recently immigrant, arrived immigrants that in our high schools didn't have an opportunity to be leaders, to be part of the extracurricular activities because of English and cultural barriers. We tried at the Latin American Youth Center to provide those opportunities that kids were not enjoying or benefiting from. Not that they were not opportunities, there were tons of them at Wilson High School. But it was aimed primarily at different uh, young kids whose culture and language different. proficiency was you know, the top. As, as for me, it was like, I felt like pollo comprado was it in, in Salvador in Spanish. And we began to create those opportunities so that people, one, felt that they had a community, felt that they were growing up the self esteem and that they were, were on their way to develop their full potential. For me, it meant going to college. I was the first one that happened to graduate from college, and it took me 15 years, but what the hell? I did it, right? Yes, <laughs> because, you did. because, um, yes, I mean, I remember that you gave me one book, Jose Suero, many years ago <laughs> by uh, Paulo Freire. And that book oh, opened I up my mind. I said, why? I don't care formal education anymore. I want to teach myself. And then later on, I realized that I needed to have some sort of a carton, a degree, so that people believe that I have some sort of education, right? So, so I, I believe that today's uh, youth, today's students, are probably facing very similar situations as we faced in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and this fight for your rights. Now probably even more so no more. Yeah. because the attacks are more pronounced. The consequences are more tragic. You know, people are getting deported. Families are being separated. You know, we have a president who think he is God. You know, so, so it, this is really more serious. So I hope that as we move on in the next decade, you know, we begin to build a community because by building communities that we build relationships, that we create networks, and that's how we build power. You know, that we believe in ourselves, that we fight for the rights, and lastly, that we become what we want to become. You want to be a doctor, become a doctor. You want to be an activist, become an activist. You want to be a dad and a father, be a dad and a good mom. You know, all those things are part of self-realization. Um, now, I'm assuming that all of us have a job and you know, we have a roof in our heads, but assuming that all of us are secure, that was my experience. And I think that that's more or less my two cents. You know, let's build community, let's love ourselves, let's have a lot of self-esteem, and then realize yourself, be all that you can be. So I'm gonna stop right there and I'll be open up for questions. Uh, hello again. Before, before we continue with the question and answer period, we have one more presentation uh, for you. Carlos Rosario's own Maria Vanessa Masagana uh, came to Washington, D.C. from Mexico in 2008. She enrolled at the Carlos Rosario School in 2011, where she studied English in ESL levels 5 through 8 at Microsoft Office. She currently works at the school as a student services program assistant, where she's a dynamic contributor to the work of helping immigrants like her achieve their dreams. She became involved with PAVE, Parents Amplifying Voices in Education in 2017. Through PAVE, she advocates for special education for children like her little boy, Alexis, who is energetic and hardworking and with us tonight. Please help me give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, thank you so much, Alison Gokoros, for thinking of me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much, uh, Sonia Gutierrez, for this school. I would like to introduce myself, not only as a Vanessa Magana. I want to introduce myself as a mother of um, so, uh, four years old, Alexis Hernandez Magana. Alexis is a um, pre-K student with special needs. 
um, my son has Down syndrome. He is the only child with Down syndrome in the entire school and uh, make me feel so proud. I am the parent of a child who has been facing a lot of struggles since he was in my belly, since he was growing up on me. Um, I am a parent who wants to see inclusive of environments for my son, who can provide services, and I want to make sure that he attends a school that meets his needs and allows him to achieve his potential and reach his goals. I, don't, I do not want him to be treated differently. I am a parent who wants to uh, see his son learn in an environment when everyone is equal and a part of the learning process. I do not want people think that my son cannot do something just because he has Down syndrome. I don't want people lab label my son as uh, retarded or Mongolian or just a person who's going to be baby forever because he's growing up. He's now older, he's going to be a teenager, and he is going to be an adult. Also, um, I believe my son has the same opportunities as any other kid. It may, it is going to be taking more time for him to reach something, but it doesn't mean that he cannot do anything. I am a parent who's fighting for his son. This is me. Thank you so much. Last year, I found PAVE uh, because I received an email. <laughs> I'm working with um, Carlos Rosario with the Student Services Department. And I received an email uh, asking me to invite parents who had kids in um, public schools. And I read the email and I said, wait, Vanessa, Alexis is attending a school, so you can apply. So apply. I applied in PAVE, and I became part of the board members. I am representing uh, Work One. And since, as I said before, I was pregnant, and I found that Alexis uh, has Down syndrome. I couldn't say that I didn't cry. Yes, I cried. Not because um, the diagnosis. I cried because I wasn't sure if I was the perfect mom or for my son. And after the, the um, confirming that he had Down syndrome, I started educating myself about Down syndrome. So I found that the key is support. So I always said, I'm ready. When Whenever my son wants to born, I'm ready for him. I'm gonna fight for his rights. And I want, I, I just start looking for the opportunity. So PAVE was the biggest opportunity of my life to fight for my, my son. Um, yes, I've been seeing changes since I've been working uh, with PAVE. Three weeks ago, I testified with the council members. I, um, I testified about the, the mayor budget hearing. And also, I found that she um, increased the education funding. So all of us are beneficiaries for, for that increase. Uh, also, my, my, my son. So I am focusing on special education because I understand that education is very important, but for uh, students like my son, besides his regular classes, he needs extra support with therapy. So I'm asking, I'm requesting uh, more therapy time. Uh, so we're working on it. Also, next uh, 
next week, we will, I'm sorry, I have so many pages here. Next uh, Wednesday, we're going to meet with Elisa Siebelman. Uh, she's a chair of Committee of Labor and Workforce Development. She is now part of the uh, Office of Education, but she is being interested in education. I know you guys um, have the Smart Trip benefit, so she is one of the person who start this um, benefit for adult education. Um, I would like also to invite you as um, please fight for whatever you need to fight, even though it's a small, you think it's a small thing. I remember uh, my brother told me when I let him know that my son had Down syndrome. And he told me, Vanessa, are you ready to just be quiet when people say bad things about your son? Because you have to be clear that you cannot fight against the whole world. And I say, well, probably I can fight against the whole world, but I can change the thoughts of people next to me. And this is my small fight. So I believe is, there are more parents outside uh, besides me who probably are scared or feel shy about asking for something good for their sons. So if you are any of those parents who are shy to speak out, please be brave and speak out. This is no important, no, it's not only important for you, but also for, for your, your kids or for to resolve your problems. I know the road is not easy, but I've been facing very hard moments in my life, so I am strong. I'm ready, and I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you to um, all of our speakers. Um, I've been waiting for, I've appreciated everyone in every moment, but I've been very excited about this part of our program because this is the part where you get to ask the speakers questions. Um, do we have one to begin? And we're gonna see if we can hear you from where you are, and if, if, if we can't, I'm gonna walk toward you and hand you the mic. So who's got the first question? Yeah. Sir? Yes, th good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Sonia Gutierrez, for taking the time for coming to here. Mr. Jose, Mr. Pedro, Mr. Jocoro, everybody. Thank you very much for, for that important time. I would like to uh, fast uh, two questions. And, but before, if I can say something, I sure. would like to say something before. Okay, sure. when I came to the United States, I looking for American dream. In past couple of years, uh, and I don't find American dream. And I say, where is American dream? Where is American dream? Let me tell you something. When I find the Carlos Rosario School, I find the American dream. Because I learned many things, especially in English. Because how can I find the American dream if we don't speak English? Mm -hmm. This is my question. How? We not can we, we not can fight the American dream if we don't speak English because Correct. one day this is true this is no joke one day I go to the meeting and I have to answer one question I don't know what question they they, they do me in the meeting but you know what question they do me in the meeting 
and, and I want, I, I have to answer the question and uh, plus a little, a little thing more. They ask me the question, Mr. Martinez, do you speak English? That's the, that's the question they ask me, and I say, not only I have to say yes, I say, yes, I speak English very well, sometimes forget my room because I told you something like that forever, forever you want. I love you too much, <laughs> Carlos Rosario School. Ah. Oh my God. You know? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. One question, when the school born, when the school, uh, how the school born, and why the name Carlos Rosario School? Thank you. The school was born in 1970, um, when uh, Carlos Rosario, who was a community activist and, and, and the leader at that time, realized that there were all these Latinos coming to the city and they didn't speak any English, they didn't know traditions, they didn't have any jobs or everything. So he, with a small group, uh, <clears throat> wrote a proposal and went to the Department uh, of Education and requested a, a $50,000 grant to establish a program to teach English. Um, he was smart enough that he he didn't have anybody to run the program, so he just knew that there had to be a program uh, to teach English, and also that it had to have counselors that would help students with problems in housing, in immigration, counseling, etc. So he went all over the place looking for, for a director, and he recruited Marcelo Fernandez Sayas, who was a Spanish teacher at Wilson High School. A great decision, because Marcelo Fernandez was a great leader and a great guy. So he recruited Marcelo, and Marcelo recruited Pedro Lujana as a community, school community coordinator, and they started running PELA. Why is this called Rosario? Okay, I'm gonna try to tell you in, uh, as fast as I can, as briefly as I can, um, that the school, um, was never going to survive just having a grant, uh, you know. So I had to secure permanent funding for the school and needed to put the school under the school system. So uh, with the help of community leaders, uh, we fought a whole year with the Board of Education and we got the, pro finally, we got the program under the regular budget of the school system. Um, and um, in 19, and in 1978, uh, you know, we didn't fit at Payla anymore. I was able to secure a school, which was called, which was Gordon Junior High School, in uh, in Georgetown. Uh, so I was successful in transferring my program to Georgetown to that school. Um, and but the school system very smart. They said, okay, Sonia, you're gonna take your program. But I had about 300 students. But you're gonna take with you Americanization School. Americanization School was a, uh, a school that was established by Congress to teach English mainly uh, to, to immigrants that were diplomats. And they came from all countries. So in 1978, we merged PELA with Americanization and became an international school. Now still, all throughout these years, and I ran the school for 42 years, um, the majority of our students are still Hispanics. Now. When, because Rosario was the one that had the idea. It was not my idea, it was his idea. Uh, if I have tremendous passion to this day for immigrants, it's because of Rosario, because he instilled that in me. He instilled that love and that dedication to immigrants. And when, um, I remember one, you know, and then when we moved to Gordon, because it had been a Gordon, uh, junior high and they closed it because of low enrollment. And I said, but you know, this, this doesn't reflect our population. You know, Gordon, who on earth was Mr. Gordon? He pr probably was a nice man, but it didn't reflect us. So I remember, because we had to do in the 70s and 80s a lot of fundraising for the, to raise money for the politicians, because the politicians are not gonna help you if, they, if you don't help them. 
and that's basic, okay? That's a, the first thing you learn. So we had a fundraiser for, for the chairman of the city council at that time, who was John Wilson, a dear friend. He passed away. Everybody from the 70s and 80s passed away. And, and Jose and I, Jose Gutierrez, was my husband. We're not husband and wife anymore, thanks to this school. But that's another story. <laughs> that's another story. Um, yeah. I mean, that's another, I'll tell you another time about that story. But we asked him, John, can you please bring a legislation into the city councils to rename Gordon School Carlos Rosario? Carlos Rosario passed away, I think it was 1987. He was only 65. But I wanted him, the one that had the idea, he never worked in the school, the one that had the idea, the one that taught me to love the community and be dedicated to my students. And he always used to tell me one thing, well, which I, I want to pass on to you. Don't worry about where Latinos come from. It's not important. The important thing is that we're all Latinos, OK? I don't care if you're Puerto Rican, Cuban, uh, Salvadorian. I hate to tell you, Salvadorians are my favorites. Or Mexicans, or Guatemalans, or Hondurans. Or, yeah, my, my grandkids are Salvadorians. So anyhow, uh, we are Latinos, and if you have a need, we're going to take care of it. Don't, care, don't even ask where you're from. So I thought I owed him so much. And you know, because of his inspiration, I turned a 100 um, student program into a school serving thousands. And, and I ran the school for 25 years as the school principal. And we trained over 40,000 people in those 25 years that I, ran, that I ran the school. So I wanted his memory to be kept because after all these years, people, and who's Carlos Rosario? Carlos Rosario is the one that had the idea of establishing a program to help immig Latino immigrants with their English language and, and everything else. So that's why it's called Carlos Rosario. Now, when the school closed in 96, after 25 years, the school system closed our school, not because it was bad, but because the city was going bankrupt, and they eliminated adult education. And because we're adult education, they eliminated us. And we, I started reestablishing the school. I started getting monies to reestablish the school. And the first school we established was in, in Chinatown in 77. A year later, we were already reestablishing the school as a small program. And um, when we submitted uh, a proposal to establish the charter, because the charter came with a lot of money, uh, people asked me, Sonia, why don't you call this school Sonia Gutierrez? I said, no. I want to call, I want to keep calling it Carlos Rosario because I don't want people to forget the great leader that told us how to love a community, how to love the immigrants, how to give education to, Im to immigrants. And my mentor, my mentor, I wanted to honor his, his, his memory. And that's why this school is called Carlos Rosario, not Sonia Gutierrez. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonia. How about a question for um, any of our other three presenters? You can also ask Vanessa a question. Sir? Thank you. My name is Leonardo Eusa. I am Carlos Rosario student at uh, Sonia Gutierrez campus. Before I ask my question, I would like to share a statement, which is my own opinion. And my statement is that no human being is illegal. And because no human being is illegal, I do believe there will be no wall to limit or stop immigration. People will always move from one border to another border, from one country to another. Now comes my question. It's my question is to Mr. Pedro Aviles. You said in your statement that today uh, challenges are more pronounced and you know, we're going through many restrictions. As development uh, organizational development specialists, uh, what will you come out as strategy for our generation to, to deal with all these uh, uh, ongoing uh, policies and restriction and situation for the future immigration, immigrant community achievement? And to finish, I will like to express my thanks to uh, Carlos Rosario, Sonia Gutierrez for, for your work 
and also for the panel. To, to say, uh, 40 years ago, you thought America great. And based on your result, I think you did it great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Wow. Strategies for today's <laughs> struggles. I, I mean, that, that's a very, um, very good question. I, I, I don't want to dodge the question. In my experience, and since you asked me to answer the question in my capacity as an organization development, the key to a good strategy is clarity of goals. And anywhere you go. If you know what you want, then you figure out what's the best strategy. Mm -hmm. I would think that one of the strategies that is being used by immigrant advocates is that we all clear on specific goals. You know, DACA is one specific goal. We want all those 800,000 kids to remain in this country because this is a country that they love and they grew up. That's, now, the strategy is gonna depend on who is at the helm of, of, of that specific struggle. There is also another, in terms of immigration, and I'm talking about immigration because probably all of us here can relate to that phenomenon. We all, some of us, this country supposedly is made out of immigrants in many ways after we you know, took this land from the Native Americans. But going back to your question is that the strategies can vary. I think what's important is clarity of goals. And in this case, I think unity among immigrants is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a goal, you know, supporting, uh, Muslim communities who are under severe attack on the part of this administration, um, supporting the struggles of DACA students, supporting the struggles of people with temporary protective status, yep. protective affordable housing. So I think that if we come to, once you identify the issue, if you have some clarity of goals, then the strategies will, will develop, will unfold. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes they just happen because you were there at the right time, at the right place. That, that would be the way that I would answer um, such a light question that you asked me. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. Another question for one of our speakers. Uh, please state your name. Good evening, I'm Claudia Esteve, and I am a proud employee of Carlos Rosario mm -hmm. School. Um, I would like to ask you, I was curious when I was listening to all three of you, so this is a question for all three. When, when things look down. School has not been just for Latinos, and we have served everybody from every country, over 60 countries in the world, and in my case, and I know in the case of Alison and others, we don't care where you come from, you're immigrants. Just besides Latinos, you're immigrants, like you're an immigrant, sir. We're gonna serve you the same way we serve Latinos. We serve everybody, but you have to have that in your heart and in your mind, because if not, we have had people in the community that, that have worked with us, but then it gets too tough and they, they they drop out because they can't take the heat. It's a lot of heat. Let me tell you, this school, just to put this in perspective, this school cost me two marriages. <laughs> my two husbands, true. My, both my husbands, my first one, que se murió. He passed away, yeah. He passed away of lung cancer. But he walked out on me because that's when I was running Pela, because I was never home. I, I used to work seven days a week because it was day and night. I'm telling you, I never got home before 11 o'clock when I was running Pela, because I didn't have the staff. It was me, Pepe, and a handful of teachers, and, and the program had to run day and night. So he told me one day, you know, you're not married to me, you're married to a school, walk out. My second husband, Jose Gutierrez, a great Latino leader, a strategy still helps me, but when the school closed, you know, in 96, he wanted me to stay home because he says, after 25 years of sacrificing your life for your school and the community, stay home. I said, no, I have to reestablish the school. So he walked out on me. Now we're great friends and he helps, he's helped me a lot. But he says he wanted his time after, tw you know. And I said, no, why? Because, Aki, you're first. But if you don't have that, you cannot do what we've done. You see Latin American Youth Center, Lori Kaplan, has dedicated 35 years of her life, or 38, right? Almost 40, I would say. Almost 40 years to Latin American Youth Center. That's an entire lifetime. You know, I've dedicated 45 years. 
um, uh, gala, Rebecca and Hugo, they started, I remember like yesterday when they began in 1975. And, and I'm telling you, they're still going. You know, you have to have dedication, dedication and love and believe in yourself. Those three things, dedication, love, and believe in yourself, and don't allow anybody to put you down. Don't allow anybody to make you believe that you're less than other people, no. And you know Trump, we'll take care of him too. We're gonna show him who we are, that we're good people, people of character, people that are hardworking people. We're not prostitutes, and we're not drug dealers, or any of that, With we're hardworking people. And how are we gonna show that? By our work. La gente se conoce por su trabajo, no por lo que digan. Pueden decir muchas cosas, but it's your work. So anyhow, I think I've talked more than enough. Thank you so much, Sonia. Don Suedo. Don Suedo, I have a question for you, if I may, Don Pedro. Uh, how would you answer this question, especially in light of the fact that you served for so many years as a writer and editor and doing the kind of work that is a lot behind the scenes and where you're not publicly exposed to as many people sometimes, how would you answer this question about keeping on and finding strength in community? Well, I, um, that's a really uh, broad and interesting question. We could spend a lot of time on it. But I, I just wanted to say that when the young lady asked her question, I, I was remembering Pedro, uh, I coached soccer at Wilson before Pedro got there. He was and on the team. And at Gordon. And at Gordon, too. I coached soccer, the school soccer from here. But I had a young man who's from West Africa. And, and he, he, you'll remember this. But when I was coaching soccer, he was my Messi. He would oh, come wow. in in the second half. Era un muchacho negro azabache, o sea, un africano. And he ran like the wind. And he was Fierce. It, 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 los muchachos americanos would get scared. Yeah, they would get literally get scared. He was rough, but he wasn't, I mean, no era sucio. He was just tough. And so much so that the referee, he would always end up being thrown out of the games. And, and the, other, the coach on the other side would always complain about this guy that ran wild all over the field. He would like run everywhere. And, and, and we would win games because psychologically, he would freak them out so much that, that they, they, they couldn't respond. Now, that man had a special quality. All of you have this quality because if not, you wouldn't have become an immigrant. You're willing to take risks, yeah. you have courage, uh -huh. you're brave, mm -hmm. you're certainly hard working. I work in the construction industry and there are no more harder working Latinos than in the construction industry. Are any of you in the construction industry here? Oh, there you go, the guy that we started with. And the lady there. So I, I wish you could remember this name because this child of God, he got a job at the Latin American Youth Center. Ernest Yumbo? Yumbo. And he has spent 30 years at the Latin He's got a family, he's got a fancy car, and every time he sees me, hey coach, how you doing coach? <laughs> you know? And he was, he's a People wonderful man. Now, now, he had so much courage and so much guts that he made it. I mean, not only because he's at the youth center, but because he did college, he, he coached other kids, and if you see him at the Latin American Youth Center, I've seen him you know, up until the last few years, he's very dedicated to kids, he's very dedicated to immigrant kids that are here. So I, I don't know if that answers really, uh, I don't know if it answers either of the questions, but the point is that as uh, Sonia and, and Pedro were speaking, I was reminded of Yombo, and, and what, a, what a beautiful spirit that young man have. And I believe in my work, why do I do this? Because it, among immigrants in general, there is such a wonderful spirit. There are people who are willing to risk their lives yes. for a better future for them and their family. Yes. And that deserves respect, not the, not the crap that's happening now. But, but yes. uh, uh, immigrants are the bloodline, the lifeline. Of America. Of, of the United States. Yes, we are. I, I just wanted to answer quickly the question, yes. uh, what do you do when you have setbacks? 
I mean, organizing, a friend of mine used to say, is like a mortgage. You know, you're going for the long haul. You're going to be fighting for a long time. Sometimes you might not be able to pay the mortgage, and you're going to have to struggle and find out how you can get people to, to, to help you. But you, you move on, and, and, and sometimes you retreat, and, and you, you, you think, hmm, what went on? It's like, let me give you an example. About, what, 2000 and, uh, what, 10 years ago, eight years ago, we were about to have immigration reform under <laughs> Bush. That's right. And it's been eight years, and we're still struggling. We're asking ourselves, what, what went wrong? Why is it? Now, we know why. There's a lot of people who are more powerful than us and who hate immigrants, and who, they're now in the seat of power. And that they've, they've made it impossible for us to get victories. But there's now more young people out there. The, the, the crowd is, is growing. So I think setbacks are part of the, the struggle. The, hence the word struggle, because you have to struggle. And sometimes you do get burned out. It happened to me. Well, that's true. I had to leave the country it for two years to because too. I was too, 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 too. burned out. You it burn is out, tiresome, yeah. you know, and sometimes you don't make money doing that. You pay money to do that. <laughs> you know, working in nonprofit sometimes is, it's, it's not really profitable. You have to you barely make an ends meet now that the city is so expensive, it's even more difficult. But, but it is hard work and you just take it as you come and you move on. You, you, you know, face the punches, roll with the punches. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Salem Takola. I'm a student here. Uh, I'm a computer literacy student. Uh, first time, uh, I will appreciate Ms. Dovina and uh, Sonia. Uh, thank you so much for your sacrifice because uh, you sacrifice a lot of year, a lot of uh, entire your time. <laughs> sorry, my, my English is bad, but you, I'm sorry. No, trying. it's not bad. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, for in 1996, in this e government, you're uh, st uh, stopping the funding. Is that time you, uh, you have the responsibility? For student, you got for code for the student, got for your home and the basement. So, what what is what is important for you is that time your responsibility? Are you afraid is that time because not at all. It's very hard. So not at all. There are two persons here that were with me a lot during that time, Alison and Carmen Ramirez, and they can tell you, I was very tired. I was very depressed. At the same time that they closed my school after 25 years of me running it, that I thought it was the end of the world. My son, Bobby, who was 28 at the time, had a near-death accident and was in a coma for a whole month. So, and I just got the strength from, from people like Alison, Carmen, and others uh, that came to the house because I didn't have a penny and um, help me, you know, we were writing proposals and everything, but not, I was not afraid, I was determined, they can tell you, I was determined that no matter what, I would reestablish the school. Why? Because of love and commitment, those two words are key, love to the school, love to the immigrants, commitment, and I had made, I remember one time at Gordon, there was a dance, and before Carlos Rosario passed away, it was like, probably 1985, and he came to the school. Our auditorium was, uh, I mean, our cafeteria was huge, and there were about a 1,000 students there dancing. There was a, um, a, some kind of activity. And Rosario looked at me and told me, Sonia, you need to promise me that no matter what happens, you are never going to allow this school to close down. And I said, Rosario, I will promise you I will never allow this school to close down. So when it close, I had to keep that promise to Rosario, number one. And number two, when I, when I got all my staff uh, and teachers together to let them know that the school was closing, right there I promised them that I would reestablish the school. And I was so sure. And Alison and Carmen can tell you, nothing stopped me. I just went out and, 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 and hustled and hustled and hustled for money till we started again after being in Georgetown in that great facility and everything, 
Carmen Allison and I um, were uh, the only place I could find to reestablish the school was a stinking basement in Chinatown. And the three of us were in that office in, in Chinatown where there were there was no windows, no nothing, no uh, we were sharing the basement with homeless people. We were sharing the bathroom with homeless people. So you, you, you know, if you're dedicated and you're focused and you have love in your heart and you have commitment, nothing can stop you. And not even my husband telling me he was going to leave me if I kept with the school, stop me. I let him go. And, and the school, and, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> now that she's not running the school, we're trying to find husband number three. No, so no, you got no. any suggestions for it? <laughs> no, I'm too old now. I'm too old now. Um, I know it's almost time for closing, but I thought um, we would be remiss if we didn't touch on the subject of my question, which I hope, um, Pedro, you will be able to answer. What lessons in inclusion have you learned through your years of activism Ooh. and building coalitions across communities? Um, I know as humans we have a lot of biases and coming from Latin America we have a long history of colonialism, a lot of biases that we carry with us. Um, what have you learned? Any lessons on inclusion and how did you apply them to your activism? Thank you, Ms. Ray. One of the uh, experiences that we had to go through right after the Mount Pleasant disturbances was uh, getting the African-American community to understand how invisible we felt. And through that process, we had to had a lot of encounters with uh, members of different communities, not only the Latino community, but all the communities that live in the neighborhoods where we used to live. Um, tolerance is one of them. Um, one of the strategies is to try to understand the white homeowners that lived or still live west of 16th Street. They all have their interests and they, you know, but you have to put yourself in their shoes. Fight them sure. when you have to fight them. You also have to understand the struggles of the African American community that live or used to live east of 16th Street because they all have a lot of struggles. And I came from El Salvador. What did I know about Martin Luther King? Very little. I think that one of the strategies that we need to learn from the other communities to learn where they're coming from yeah. and understand, true. True. like for example, the Muslim community at this very moment, what efforts are we taking to understand what they're going through at this very moment because they're not the only ones. There are a lot of them that are going through you know, the LGBT community, the undocumented community, you name it, oppression, there is a lot of it going around. So I think that one of the strategies that, that, that we use, and I think we're still using, is to try to understand where other people are coming from, but more importantly, and I think, uh, Anna, you said that, is to understand that we do have implicit, unconscious biases. True. And to be uh, strong enough to say, yes, what, did, what, what in me is, is, is looking me, uh, it's making me look at this person, at this individual, in a way that it is unconsciously um, uh, making me either treat that person differently than I would think about myself. Because we all, I mean, this is male, female, black, white, you know, whatever, immigrant, documented, US citizen. They're all different cuts to the different issues that are going on in our minds. So it's very complex, but I think the most important thing in my experience is one is, am I willing to listen, put myself in that other person's shoes and be able to understand and be more tolerant, even though I might disagree completely with the way in which they see the world? Thank you. I, I just, I just want to add something. Uh, uh, Pedro spoke about the, uh, the, the Mount Pleasant uprising in 1992. That is a key, I, I know Naomi, and I know if you got a proposal, it's, the proposal is 70s and that's what it is, but that is one of the key moments in the development of this community. Pedro knows this better than anybody. We were national and international news, and I'm very proud, and yeah. I want to give a shout out to, to Raynal Woodeman, who's sitting in the front row, because they have recorded 
a session that we did with Sharon Pratt Kelly, uh, uh, Carmen's old boss, and Mayor. Ike Fullwood, may he rest in peace, who was the police commissioner at the time. The Smithsonian has it recorded, although I find it difficult to find, Reynold, but, but the point is that if we're talking about seminal moments in this community, again, Pedro, we couldn't have Pedro that day. You were traveling, you were, you were you're doing your sabbatical in, in El Sal. But but that moment, those two nights. No, no, I was here. No, he was here. I was Kelly. one of the guests. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember Cen Centurion, so I thought it was either you or Centurion. Centurion. Okay, so he was on that panel too. But if if you want to see that panel, go to the Masone. Uh, uh, Reynold, how can they see that recording? <laughs> All right, I'm sorry I got that confused, okay. Pedro. Thank you, and with that, we're gonna close. Thank, I wanted to thank uh, our speakers so much for sharing their stories with us, and uh, this is just what we hear tonight, what we heard tonight is just a fragment of a much, much larger story, and this is what we're hoping to be able to share through the Nuestra Ciudad project. Thank you again so much, and thank you also, Vanessa. Thank you for being here.